Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, this will be the final group. We're going to talk about the vertebrates uh, today and that will conclude our animal lectures and we'll go into the human systems next. Okay, so just as a reminder, all chordates are not vertebrates, but all vertebrates are chordates, so let's review the characteristics of chordates. Remember, all chordates share four features at s these four features at some point in their life. They all have a notochord that supports the body. They have a nervous system that develops from the dorsal tubular nerve cord. Um, they have pharyngeal gill slits, and they have a tail that is postanal. The two invertebrate chordate groups are the tunicates and the lancelets, and we covered those in the last lectures. Um, but remember that they don't have a cranium or vertebrae. But all of the other chordates are craniates, so the fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. So the early craniates um, had a brain that is contained inside a chamber of cartilage or bone, and they arose before 530 million years ago. The earliest ones resembled lampreys, which are modern fishes that exist without fins or jaws. They were followed by a group called the astracoderms, which were still jawless, but they had hardened external plates, which you can see is the little top picture there. The placoderms were the first fishes with jaws and paired fins, which became replaced by cartilaginous and bony fishes. Key innovations in the vertebrate group started with the single continuous notochord that was replaced by bone tissue forming a column of separate hardened vertebrae, parts of which became modified near the head to form jaws. Jaws allowed new feeding possibilities, coupled with better eyes for detecting both prey and predators. Sorry. The fishes, uh, it's just not working for me, I'm sorry about that, it was supposed to flip through. Okay, the fins of fishes were the starting points for the legs, arms, and wings seen among the higher vertebrates, and gradually there was less reliance on gills and more on lungs and the circulatory system, or heart and blood vessels, which work in connection. And yes, there are fishes that have lungs. And for those of you who wonder, fishes me is is the plural for fish when you were talking about multiple species. Um, if you talk about many of one type of fish, then it's fish, plural. But if you are talking about multiple types, then it's fishes. So the first chordates in the family tree are the hagfishes and the lampreys, and the remaining groups include the cartilaginous fishes, bony fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. The two existing jawless fishes are hagfish and lampreys. By the way, hagfish are also called slime eels, and uh, when people sell you a wallet made of electric eel skin, it's actually made out of hagfish skin, and they eat dead animals that f fall to the bottom of the ocean. Pretty disgusting. Um, they all have a cylindrical body and a cartilaginous skeleton, but they don't have paired fins or jaws, so they are either uh, detritivores or they're parasites. The cartilaginous fishes um, are jawed fishes, and uh, these are the most diverse and numerous group of the vertebrates, so there's more fishes than any other kind of things, and the two classes include the cartilaginous fishes, which is class chondrichthys, and the bony fishes, which are osteichthys. Enormous numbers of fishes attest to their success in meeting the challenges of life in the water. Their streamlined bodies allow for easy movement, through the dense medium. Fish scales protect the body without weighing it down, and the swim bladder provides buoyancy. All cartilaginous fishes possess a streamlined body with a cartilaginous endoskeleton, gill slits, and fins. The group chondrichthys includes the sharks, the skates, the rays, Oops, let's go back down. And the chimeras, or cold ratfish. 
Sharks are formidable predators with their powerful jaws and teeth, which are replaceable. They go through many, many sets of teeth throughout their lifetime. Skates and rays live on the ocean bottom, where they feed on invertebrates and uh, some fishes, and some of them can jolt prey with electricity or sting with a venomous tail spine, just like the one that got Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. Class Osteichthys means bony fishes, and bony fishes are the most numerous and diverse of the vertebrates. Descendants of ancestors that arose in the Silurian period have radiated into nearly every aquatic habitat. Bony fish body plans vary from torpedo shape to eel shape to the peculiar seahorses, and this one here is one of my favorites, the leafy sea dragon. The ray-finned fishes are highly maneuverable thanks to their fins, which are supported by rays that originate from the dermis. Bony fishes include 96% of the living species, and it has three subclasses, the ray-finned fishes, the lobe-finned fishes, and the lung fishes. The lobe-finned fishes um, bear fleshy extensions to the body that are quite strong. This is a coelacanth, which is a living fossil or cryptid, because um, they thought they went extinct about 25 million years ago until the 1930s when a fish biologist, which is called a nycteologist, was on his honeymoon in Madagascar and he saw this fish being sold at a fish market. And he was just amazed because he knew that they were extinct, or he thought he knew they were extinct, but it turns out that there are pockets of these guys um, in several places around the world. And when he asked the guy selling it uh, what they used it for, he says, oh, we don't eat them. We use their skins as bicycle tires because it's so thick and tough. Now, the lobe fin fishes do have lung-like sacs, but they don't function in gas exchange. But they do in the lung fishes. They have gills and one or a pair of lungs that are modified gut wall outpouchings and they have to come to the surface to gulp air. Fishes probably share a common ancestor with the tetrapods or four-legged animals because the fish structures and the tetrapod structures are homologous and you can see here's the limb bones in a lobe fin fish and here's the limb bones in the tetrapod and you can see that they're the same they've just taken on different shapes. Early amphibians were fish-like, and they had a fish-like skull and tail. But they also had four limbs with digits, and the digits were often very stubby, um, and they had a short neck. Amphibians have a body plan and a mode of reproduction somewhere between fishes and reptiles. They're called amphibians. Amphi means double, and bios means life, because they have a double life. They live both on the land and in the water. Life on land presented new challenges to the emerging amphibians. Water availability wasn't reliable. Air temperatures were very variable, and the air itself was not, give, not the strong supporting medium that water is, but it was a richer source of oxygen. So they also had new habitats they were moving into, including vast arrays of plants, which necessitated development of keener sensory input structures. Existing amphibians share several common characteristics. All of them have a bony endoskeleton and usually four legs. Depending on their habitat, amphibians can respire by the use of gills, lungs, their skin, and their pharyngeal lining. The skin is usually very thin and sometimes supplies with glands that can produce toxins. Even though most amphibians are aquatic, none of them has escaped the water entirely, for they have to return to it to lay eggs, which will produce larvae dependent on a watery environment because they have gills. Amphibian lungs are less efficient than those of other vertebrates. They're very basic sacs, and their skin also can serve as a respiratory organ. Now, there are three primary amphibian groups, the frogs and toads, salamanders, and sicilians. Frogs and toads are the best known group, and these animals possess those long hind limbs capable of responding um, 
with powerful muscles. Their success on land is due in part to the excellent prey-grasping ability of the tongue that is attached at the front of the mouth. The way you can tell between a frog and a toad is that frogs always hop and toads can walk. Salamanders have an elongated body with a tail that persists into adulthood, where it's lost in the frogs and toads. When they walk, the body bends from side to side, much like a fish moving through the water. The Sicilians are a different group. They've lost both their limbs and their vision. They're unusual creatures that live burrowed in the forest floor where they hunt for invertebrates, usually like worms. They have no limbs, but do have small scales embedded in the skin to help them move through the soil. So this group was the first of the vertebrate groups to really move on to land. Technically it was lobe fin fishes or lung fishes, but when they finally really did that, it was by developing those lungs, which you find in the amphibians. So that's their big evolutionary achievement. The next big evolutionary achievement was being able to move away from that source of water, because remember the amphibians are attached uh, to that water source, at least for breeding time. So the reason they did that was the rise of the amniotic egg. Amphibians gave rise to the amniotes, who were characterized with three features that are critical to their escape from that water dependency. They produce amnio eggs with covering membranes and a shell, which allows those eggs to be laid in dry habitats. They have a toughened, dry, or scaly skin that is resistant to drying out, and their kidneys are good at conserving water. So the question that always comes up is, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, it was definitely the egg, because the reptile started it first. All species of t lizards, turtles, tuataras, snakes, and crocodilians are all cold-blooded, and they have internal fertilization and a cloacal opening for reproduction and excretion. The crocodiles and alligators all live in or near the water. The body plan for them includes a long snout. Body temperature is also regulated behaviorally. They are ectothermic, which means they'll move into the sun when they get cold. They move out of the sun when they get too hot. Turtles possess a distinctive shell that offers protection while conserving water and body heat. Instead of tur teeth, turtles have horny plates like beaks that are used to grip and chew food. Turtle eggs are vul vulnerable to predators, which results in their declining numbers worldwide. Lizards and snakes are actually one group, and they're the largest order of living reptiles. They make up 95% of all living reptiles. Most lizards are insectivores with small peg-like teeth. Lizards are the most diverse reptiles. Most of them are small-bodied insect eaters, although the marine iguanas of the Galapagos are herbivores. Their most usual habitats are deserts and tropical forests. Some, such as the monitor lizard, can also subdue deer, while many are prey for other animals. The snakes are all descended from short-bodied long uh, er, lizards. All are carnivores. There are no vegetarian snakes at all. And they, many of them have flexible jaws with that permit swallowing quite large whole prey. They don't chew. Snakes are limbless, but retain vestiges of hind limbs. In the python group especially, um, they have still their hip girdles, and you can see little claws sticking out of the sides where their hips would be. Uh, many snakes are venomous and may bite humans, especially when provoked. The tuataras are kind of an odd group. They're considered kind of like a mixture of amphibian and reptile characteristics, so it kind of gets kind of interesting there. Um, they also have a really unusual characteristic in that they have their pineal gland actually on the surface of their head. Uh, our pineal gland is deep within our brain, back behind the eyeballs. There are only 
uh, two species that remain today because this is a very evolutionarily ancient line. They live on the islands off the shores of New Zealand, and they have this third eye that can detect changes in day length and light intensity, which changes their hormonal control of reproduction. Many of the ways that their brain and the way that they walk resembles amphibians, which is why I said they're kind of a transitional group. The next group are the birds, and they diverged from small theropod dinosaurs during the Mesozoic era. Feathers are a unique trait to birds, and they were derived from reptilian scales. It's made out of the same stuff. Their feathers, scales on a, a reptile, your nails and hair, they're all made of the same structures just slightly modified. Feathers not only serve for flight, but they also serve in insulation. And modern research has shown that those theropod dinosaurs also had feathers at certain points in their lifespans. Birds apparently evolved from the reptiles, and the oldest known bird called Archaeopteryx, which means ancient wing, resembled reptiles in its limb bones and other features, including having teeth. Birds are an incredibly diverse in color, courtship, song, and size, and include the very large flightless ones like the ostriches, cassowaries, and emus. Birds still resemble reptiles because they have horny beaks, scaly legs, and they are egg-laying just like the, the reptiles. However, they have several unique features. Feathers covering the wings make a good flight surface and conserve metabolic heat in the body that insulation thing again. Heat is generated and regulated from within the body. So the birds um, are endotherms, and this is the first of the living groups that is. Um, there is a lot of debate about whether dinosaurs were endotherms, and there is a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that yes, they probably were. Um, we don't have a definitive answer on that yet, but the book is nearly closed on that one. The heart in birds is a four-chambered heart, which means that the circulatory system for deoxygenated blood and oxygenated blood are completely separated, making it far more efficient. The lungs are also highly efficient because of their flow-through design of multiple air sacs plus the lungs, and the bones in a bird's body are lightweight because of air cavities within them. They have powerful muscles that are attached at strategic places on the bones for maximum leverage. And now we're on to our group, the mammals. Modern mammals are characterized by the following. They have hair that covers at least part of the body, except for some whales. They have milk secreting glands which nourish their young. They have dentition that is extensive and specialized to meet dietary habits. This is a key factor for mammals, is that their teeth are reflecting what kind of things that they eat. So if you take a look here, they, you can see the four main types of teeth, the canine incisors, molars, and premolars on this chimpanzee. Well, you see it has fairly large developed canines. That's because chimps eat meat in addition to a vegetarian diet. Brain capacity in mammals is increased, which allows more capacity for memory, learning, and conscious thought. And mammals also show behavioral flexibility, which is the ability to expand on the basics with novel forms of behavior, so they can invent new types of behavior. So there are three main groups of the mammals, the monotremes, marsupials, and eutherians. Monotremes are the few egg-laying mammals, marsupials have pouches, and the eutherians produce a placenta. Egg-laying mammals, the monotremes, are represented today by only the duck-billed platypus and the spiny anteaters, which there are two species, in Australia and Papua New Guinea. The spiny anteaters have protective spines, they burrow, and they eat ants. Oddly enough, that's why they were named that. All monotremes lay eggs, but they do suckle their young and have hair, just like other mammals. Marsupials are the pouched mammals, and they give birth to tiny, blind, hairless, 
underdeveloped young that find their way to the mother's pouch, which is called the marsupium, where they are then suckled and finish their development in the pouch. So they don't get born basically done. They have to develop further outside of the mother's body in the pouch. Um, and very often, once they've locked on to that teat, uh, they don't let go for several months. And you can see here on the left-hand side is North America's only marsupial, the Virginia opossum, even though they're not only in Virginia. And over on the right is one of my favorites, the wombat. The eutherians are the most successful group. In fact, the only, the reason there's only one type of marsupial here in North America is because they could not compete with the placental mammals. They got outcompeted, and so they went extinct. The opossum formed kind of a marginal role, and its niche was never competed for, really. And they exist mostly in the islands and the island continent of Australia because uh, it was isolated much earlier before the rise of placental mammals. So placental mammals nourish their young within the mother's uterus by the placenta, which is a composite of maternal and fetal tissue. The placenta is the organ of exchange of nutrients and wastes between the maternal blood and the fetal blood. The placental nourishment is, the, is more efficient than the nourishment of the pouched animals, and representatives of this group are found pretty much in every aquatic and terrestrial environment on the planet. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our animal lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we will move on into human systems next, and have a great night.